And we're going to start off with a proof based approach to formalizing protocols in linear epistemic logic. Elizabeth Davis. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, like Tom said, my name is Elizabeth Davis, and my thesis is on formalizing protocols in linear epistemic logic. So, some introduction. Um, what we essentially did was a case study on the Needham Schroeder Low um, public key authentication protocol, which um, is a protocol between um, three principles, um, a, an approacher, a provo key, and a key server. Um, and the approacher is trying to establish a secure communication session with the provo key. So I'm going to explain the notation here because it's a little cryptic looking. Um, in the first step, the approacher sends the key server a request for P's public key. Um, in the second step, the server sends the approacher um, a, an encrypted message containing P's public key and P's identity. Um, this message is encrypted with S's, public, S's private key. Um, we call this a digitally signed message because um, because public and private keys are inverses of each other, um, so they can, they can decrypt each other. Um, in the third step, A sends P a message containing a nonce, or a session, a one-time session tag that they generated, um, and their own identity, in a message encrypted with P's public key. At this point, P contacts the server and says, hey, give, me, um, give me A's public key. And like before, the server um, sends a digitally signed message containing A's public key and um, A's identity. And in the next step, the provo key sends the approacher, um, the approacher's nonce, um, the provo key's nonce, and the, a, a nonce that the provo key generated himself, and um, the provo key's own identity in a message encrypted with A's public key. Um, and in this final step, a sends P just a message containing P's, um, P's nonce encrypted with P's public key. And in going through these steps, we're supposed to conclude that um, the approacher and the promo key have established a secure session with each other. So I had to explain that protocol to you. I had to tell you that each step, here's what's going on. Um, we that, that we're supposed to deduce that um, that A has learned P's public key from receiving it from the server, um, and that and that they can then use it to encrypt um, messages sent to P. But that that kind of information isn't encoded in the syntax of the protocol implementation. It's all it's all sort of pros and common sense um, conclusions that we draw. So what we wanted to do was formalize this protocol. So in general, protocols are multi-step um, are given as a set of steps that principles follow in order to accomplish a goal. Um, where you know A sends a message to B containing M, B sends A a message containing a message that is a function of M. Um, again, there is no information that tells us that B didn't just guess M out of the blue and send this, this functional message. We don't realize this. There's nothing encoding the dependency between steps. So what we want to do is formalize this dependency using linear epistemic logic. So linear epistemic logic is an extension of linear logic, which basically is a knowledge that treats, is, is a logic that treats um, facts as consumable resources. So if at time t you have a dollar and the ability to purchase a Sprite, then at time t plus one you should have traded this dollar and ability to purchase for a Sprite. You shouldn't still have the dollar. So your the facts that you have change. Um, so linear logic inherently supports a notion of state and changing the state. So linear epistemic logic is the same sort of state transition logic, but with an extension of knowledge, possession, and affirmation. So, and we call these modalities. Um, so the first modality, knowledge, 
is notated with this double bracket, um, K and A. The, the judgment form of that is that K knows A, and we are to understand this as a principle K having knowledge of proposition A. And by knowledge, we mean persistent knowledge. Once you know this fact, it's not going to change ever. Um, and we have possession, which is essentially a linear form of knowledge, where principle K has A. Um, they have it now, it might change. And we also have affirmation with this angle bracket, um, where if K, K says A, and the way this works is that K can't say anything that they don't know to be true. We also have another, we also have a notion of notating state transitions, which we notate, um, we notate a state as a pair of contexts, gamma and delta, where gamma is the set of persistent facts that you have, and delta is the set of um, linear facts that you have. And gamma, the state gamma delta, transitions to state gamma prime delta prime. So, um, if there exists, a if and only if there exists a derivation um, gamma prime delta well, gamma delta to gamma prime delta prime, the proofs are read upward. Um, and this is a way of saying that you consume, you you use facts at this state to get to this state. Um, on top of that, we use state transition sequences, which are a way of labeling um, state transitions, where it's it's in the reflexive transitive closure of this writer of state transition, um, we label the steps. So, looking again, we're, we're trying to use this logic to, yes? Was there only one derivation going up that, of that time, or at most one <coughs> derivation going up at that time? Um, or there can be more than one transition? I'm not entirely sure what you mean. The, the transition. Oh. Maybe I don't want to do really anyway. So. Yeah, this is this this is defined in another paper by Frank and Henry Young. Um, so we want to express this protocol using linear epistemic <laughs> logic. Um, and a little motivation for that. Why do we want to do that? Why is it important that we be able to talk about the knowledge states? Um, so Needham Schroeder Low is actually a variation on the Needham Schroeder public key authentication protocol um, developed as a predecessor. It's nearly identical, except for in step six, when Provoke sends a response to the overture, they don't include their own identity. And in 1995, um, Lowe showed that you can stage an imposter attack at this step if um, you, don't, you don't have confirmation of who you're talking to. Um, and this is this is really important because this is a security protocol. Suppose that you know. So what happens is the the imposter gets A to start a session with them, and then the imposter pretends to be A and talks to P. If P is say a bank. You don't you you want to know your protocol is safe, and this intruder model throws a wrench in the mix. Um, so we want to know at you know step six that A knows they're starting a session with P. So what we do is we annotate each step with the knowledge that we that we think every or that we that we know every um, every principle should have at the end of the step. So formalizing the protocol. So we have our we have our initial knowledge <laughs> where everyone should know their own private key. Um, Everyone should know the server's public key in order to decrypt digitally signed messages. Um, and the server should, being a server, know everyone's, um, know everyone's public key and their own private key in order to digitally sign those messages. So at the end of you know, step two, we should have that A knows his public key. We should know that. Um, we should know that upon P, upon A sending this overture to P, that P realizes they're being, um, they're being approached for starting a session. We should be able to say that at the end of step four, A knows that, um, sorry, that, that the server knows they have a key request, that, um, <coughs> or that they realize they're in the beginning of a key request sequence, and at step five, that now P knows A's public key, and so on. And 
at the end of the protocol, we should be able to say that A and P have established a secure session with each other, playing the role of the approacher and the proto key, respectively. Um, and our session should be annotated with their nonces and the identities. So, what does that mean? What does it mean for E to be a session? What does it mean to for P to be a secure session with A? Um, so, do you mean with respect to the protocol or in general? Even with respect to the protocol, okay. what does it mean? So, in general, it means that um, if a, a, and B, a and P can exchange messages with each other securely, knowing they know who they're talking to and they have information that says that we're talking at this point in time in this session. This is, this is sort of a property that's part of the protocol itself, but I'm, I'm sorry for the resolution. Um, we have, it's, it's a way of the, um, if you, if you send messages including the nonces and encrypted with the public keys, you know who it came from. Because there's a way to spoof identities online. You want to know that you've gone through the steps. And so it doesn't mean in particular that no one else knows the key. <coughs> well, no one else should know the nonces. That's why we encrypt them. Yeah, but formally, does your judgment imply that or not? Um, so, so that's, that's actually kind of what I'm getting to in my next point. Okay, well, after this next point. So, we, um, in transitioning through these knowledge states, we go through a series of actions. Um, so, when A sends the server a key request, S, the server has to, one, receive the message, two, recognize it as a key request, Three, encode the public key as a message, and then digitally sign this message, um, and then send it to A. Um, when A, before A extends this overture to the promo key, they have to first receive the message from the server, they have to decrypt the message, they have to learn the key, and they have to generate, so they have to learn the key, they learn the key. Um, then they generate the nonce for the session. Um, they create an overture message with the nonce and their identity. And they encrypt the message. And then they send it. So there's a bunch of implicit steps that are going on. There's the encryption, there's the decryption, there's processing the message that you receive. Because the idea is you receive a message over the network. It's just a message until you reason about it. So we make, we make these steps. Um, Explicit, and so what we do in our formalism is that we create a set of rules that combines. Um, yes, Tom. Let's see, sorry. That we combine the knowledge um, that they that they have about the session, the linear knowledge and the persistent knowledge, and we we define a state transition that takes you from one knowledge state to the next knowledge state, saying I've gone, I've I've, I've processed this information, and I'm moving to the next state. And so what we do then is that we prove, we prove its adequacy. And this is essentially proving the correspondence between, um, the, between our formalism and the protocol as it is specified. So first, we define our initial state, gamma delta, which, um, as we mentioned before, is um, knowledge of the private keys, knowledge that the server is a server, knowledge of the public keys. And we seed our initial state with a needing P's public key, and if their intent to start a session from the init um, step with, with the promo key. We define a pretty involved state transition sequence which corresponds to, which we claim corresponds to knowledge states that the promo key and the, the approach of the promo key and the server must go through in order to have followed the protocol. Um, according to specification. And what we prove then is that every derivation, like that you, you have a derivation from your initial state to a terminal state where A and P know each other's public keys and they have, um, they have session app and session prop, um, which are our, our successful state, successful session conclusions um, predicates. We say that it must correspond to an execution of the Needham-Schroeder-Low product protocol if and only if this 
transition state epsilon prime corresponds to this transition state epsilon, state, state transition sequence, excuse me. Um, so proving that, we prove that the formalism is sound and complete with respect to the protocol. We prove that um, there exists a derivation from gamma naught delta naught to, um, to the terminal state um, that follows the state transition sequence. And we prove that all derivations of this form, all, all derivations from the initial state to the terminal state, must follow the specified epsilon form. So we were able to do this. And so we were able to successfully prove these theorems. And what we've shown is that you can, you can express a protocol in terms of the knowledge state, which gives you so much more expressivity. And it makes it easier to identify vulnerabilities because of what knowledge each principle has at each step. So that was my work for the year. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you for listening.